Christ Community Church, located at 25th and Thomas Avenue in Portsmouth, Ohio. Let me go ahead and, and warn you uh, ahead of time. Um, if I'm walking funny, it's not because Megan finally lost it and took the Louisville slugger that I keep next to my bed to me. Um, it's not because of that. Uh, it's because this week um, I have uh, contracted shingles. And so I've got it all around my, it's just, and you know, I always grew up hearing how painful shingles were. Um, they were not exaggerating. Um, it stinks. Um, it really hurts. So if, if during, um, I mean, they gave me medicine and all that kind of stuff, but if during the sermon you see me like gripping real hard, every once in a while I would go, ah, you can, you can rack that up to a Pentecostal moment if you want. That's fine. But it just, it just hurts. And, um, and so, and, but this is the way it is. Mom and dad, are on a well-earned vacation. Uh, they're on their way. They got there yesterday. They went to the beach, and uh, mom especially earned it because she was in a car wreck this week. Uh, Told her car. Uh, she's fine. She's just a little sore, but uh, she definitely couldn't wait to get to the beach and, and and relax. And so they've had quite the week. So with mom and dad gone, and and Ralph still recovering from surgery on on his hand. And, you know, all that kind of stuff to quote uh, the existential poets, the band Queen, the show must go on. So here I am. Um, we're going to jump back into Genesis 3 and talk about a number of things there and what they tell us about sin and what they tell us about ourselves. And then we'll talk about exactly what we can do in response to all of that. Um, we have a problem that is only being recognized in certain corners of Christianity in, in North America. Uh, even though there are spots in the other parts of the world that are dealing with it too. Eddie and Patrick, bless their hearts, will, are dealing with it in Uganda. Which is, um, most churches don't talk about sin. And, and, and in fact, uh, the largest church in America, in Texas, the senior pastor there has said he will not talk about sin because that's depressing. Um, he has said that he will never put up a cross in his church building because that's depressing. And this is the largest church in North America. And yet, as I said many times, to kind of paraphrase the great evangelist John Wesley, you cannot understand the good news until you understand the bad news. And the bad news is we are all sinners. And we sin every day. But we have a church at large because pastors, unfortunately, their egos come into play and they want big churches and they want book deals and they want speaking gigs and they want, you know, the number one top downloaded podcast and they want a lot of hits on YouTube and all that kind of stuff. So what they do is they preach sermons that are primarily affirmation telling you how great you are, or they preach sermons about gifts. What are your gifts? Discover your gifts. Now, there's nothing wrong with talking about gifts, but the problem is the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, its primary concern with those who are studying it and who call themselves Christians are not with necessarily discovering your gift or feeling good about yourself. 
It is, number one, having faith in Jesus Christ, and number two, having a character that strives to be holy as your God is holy. Character is much more important to God than your self-esteem or discovering your gifts. And that's what we're really talking about here. You know, Gracie read Genesis 3. There are a number of things to pick out of that. I remember the first time I seriously read Genesis 3. I'm a preacher's kid, so I've heard it all my life. But I didn't really read Genesis 3 until I became a Christian at 25. And I dusted off a Bible that my older sister had given me. And I opened it up, and I started reading from Genesis 1 on. And I get to Genesis 3. And I'm thinking, what am I reading? What is this about a talking snake and these people, Adam and Eve, in which all people have come from just seem like complete idiots? I mean, what are they doing? Well, there are a couple things you need to know. Number one, when it says that the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made, what what it's really saying there is that Satan is the shrewdest. We learn later in Revelation and other places that, you know, they call him the serpent, but it's really it's Satan that's doing this. And Satan, according to Jewish writings, this is not biblical, so take it with a grain of salt, these are ancient Jewish writings, state that Satan was not only an angel, he was a cherubim, he was one of the highest angels, along with Michael and Gabriel. He was one of the few angels that's even been named. Some Jewish sources even say Satan was the choir leader of heaven before he fell. But Satan, and this is ironic because it'll play into what we're about to see, Satan's fall came out of what? Self-love. What does Satan say when he scurries up to Adam and Eve? And by the way, he's talking to Eve, but the the text is very clear. Adam is standing right there. Adam's going to make excuses. Ah, That's this woman you gave me. And God's like, "Eh, you mean the woman I gave you who was standing six inches away? Why didn't you speak up, big boy? Tries to throw Eve under the bus. It doesn't work. What what are Satan's words to Adam and Eve? Do you want to be like God? Why are those the first real words from Satan's mouth to human beings? What does he want? He wants them to fall from favor with God. How did Satan fall from favor with God? He wanted to be like God. He takes his own sin, and he tries to tempt others with it. Now, we'll talk more about this next week when we get to Genesis 4, and we talk about Cain and Abel and how sin spreads. And so Satan comes up to them, and he says, you know, he asks them a question, did God really say you can't eat of that over there? And he said, well, Eve said, well, we can eat from any tree except for that one. He says, if we do that, we will die. And Satan says, oh, you won't die. Now, Satan, not surprisingly, would have made a good lawyer. And apparently Amber Heard needed one. But they, what is Satan in it? They're, they're talking across each other, but they sound like they're saying the same thing. Satan says, oh, you won't die. And what does he mean by that? He means if you go over and you eat that fruit, the moment you take a bite out of it, you're not going to have a widow maker and fall over. But what God was talking about was something different. He was telling Adam and Eve that if you eat of that tree that I told you not to, death will now become a factor in your life where it had not been before. If Adam and Eve had obeyed, the Bible was pretty clear 
they would have continued to live in paradise with God walking amongst them and never faced death, never faced sickness, never faced decay. If they would have just, we use the word obey, but really it's trust. If they just would have trusted God. And that's really one of the things sin comes down to. Yes, we have this inherited nature, like a piece of our DNA that we have inherited from Adam and Eve. That's true. But we also have this. And we go through this as children. I want you to think back. If you can't remember when you were a child, remember when you had children, remember your grandchildren, or heck, if you volunteered back in the ark, just think about kids. Little kids, little, little kids, especially with their parents. If their parents are good parents, if they love them, if they care for them, the child trusts them, right? When my son Jackson was wee little, when he was a year, 18 months old, I just saw him last week, by the way, he's now 19 and 6 foot 2. I don't know where that came from, because he had single Rawlings over 6 foot. But, and he just finished his first year at Liberty, and I'm proud of him, but when Jackson was wee little, he would do this thing that I discouraged him from doing. He would hear me, he would take his nap, and I remember especially when I was studying for the bar and I was home all the time trying to study for the bar exam and I'd hear him wake up and so I was trying to potty train him so the first thing you do when you wake a kid up is rush into the bathroom and so I'm running into the there hoping he doesn't you know he, he, he'll hit the toilet before he hits the diaper and I, you know I, I, as soon as I click the door open he's climbing up his crib and he got to an age where he could swing his leg over and he'd start to stand up on his crib like Jackson, and he would just throw himself at me, and I'd catch him. And he'd just look at me and smile. Like, I knew you were going to do that. That's trust. That's trust. And that's what God want, wanted from Adam and Eve. Because I want you to think about something. Think about the text that, that Gracie just read to you. God says, do not eat of that tree, the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And yet, it is not till later, after they eat, that their eyes are opened and they realize what good and evil is. What does that mean? When God said, that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they had no idea what he was talking about. They don't know what good and evil is. They know God the Father. And that's it. And they trust him, and they do what he says, and, 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 and that's it. What is good and evil? I don't know, but that's just the name he came up with. It's not till their eyes are open after they've sinned that they know good and evil. I don't know how many of you remember when Patrick and Eddie were here, every once in a while they would lapse into their native language. And I'd just be looking at them like, what are you talking about? The best story was we were... My wife, I think it was the first Christmas they were here, Megan. Very first Christmas they were here, Megan took Patrick and Eddie Christmas shopping up to the Huntington Mall. And she had Carter in the back seat. And one of them, I think it was Patrick, was FaceTiming one of his friends in Uganda, and he was speaking his native language. And... Patrick asked Carter, little Carter, back then, back, she was yay big, said, do you want to say hi? And she grabs the phone and goes, boo doo 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 And Patrick and Eddie just lose it. <laughs> and, but to Adam and Eve, good and evil, that's what it meant to them. It's gobbledygook. They don't know what that means yet. They're like my son, just jumping off the crib, knowing that daddy will catch it, if they have that kind of trust. And 
I had a professor in seminary argue that the number one question of the Bible is, will you trust God? To Adam and Eve, do not eat of that tree, eat of any of the rest of them, I'll be here for you, trust me. Next week, what does God say to Cain? Sin is crouching at your door, you must master it, trust me. To Abraham, leave your father and your home country, go to here, start a new nation, trust me. To the Israelites, I have sent you Moses. He's going to lead you out into the wilderness, eventually into the promised land. Trust me. I know the promised land is overrun with these huge soldiers who outnumber you, and they're bigger than you, and they're stronger than you, but you need to go in there and run them out anyway. Trust me. Again and again and again, trust me, culminating in, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Trust me. And what is our response, our collective human response throughout the Bible? Here's what happens to all kids. I always heard about the terrible twos. I would trade three years of the terrible twos for any of the threes and fours. Because when they start asking questions, heaven help us. When it becomes why, right? Been through that with kids? You need to do this. Why? Eat that. Why? Do that. Why? And of course, at some point, we all have that shining parental moment when we go, because I said so. But this is what they grow into. It, there's, there is an erosion of trust there, isn't there? Because now it's why. And Adam and Eve have gone to, Satan comes along and says, wouldn't you like to be like God? Doesn't it look good? And eh. Oh, he tell you, told you that you would die? Oh, you won't die. And so their erosion of trust begins and they sin. This happens with kids. And unfortunately, every single one of us, what is our number one faith struggle when it comes to living a life of holiness before God? Why? 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 We're not trusting God. We're not trusting God. And Satan's words still echo. Do you want to be like God? Do you want to be like God? Don't you want to be like God? And our answer is, yeah. Every time we sin, every time we sin, what are we doing? We are saying we want to be like God. In what way? This way. I know what's best. When you sin, you are telling God, I know what's best for me, not you. Isn't that what it is? We go through this in life. I've been through this with people who struggle with addiction. The Bible says, don't be a drunkard, don't be an addict. The Bible says that the person you marry, that spouse, that's it. That's your definition of beauty. That is your one partner. Unless they abandon you or die, that's it. And yet, according to statistics, the majority of men in America have an electric harem on their computer. And when men do that, what are they saying? I know best. I know what's best for me. So, it's all trying to tell God, I know best, I want to be like you. And then, so Adam and Eve sin. So they eat of the fruit, they disobey God, they don't trust God. 
And what's their immediate response? They realize they are naked. And they run into the bushes and the trees. And they start to take stuff from the bushes and the trees to make coverings for themselves. What is that? That's shame. That's shame. And a true Christian, someone who really has faith in Jesus Christ, when they sin, will feel shame. And the irony is this, and I heard Tony Evans say this. Megan and I were listening to Dr. Tony Evans preach on this yesterday, and Dr. Evans said this. He said, isn't it strange that Adam and Eve jump into the bushes and they start grabbing leaves and all that kind of stuff to try to cover themselves in their shame and in their sin? And yet, in Genesis 1, when God creates the earth, including the trees and the bushes, what does God call that? He says, this is good. In their sin and their shame, they hide from God in the midst of God's blessing. Now, we can look at that, and we can look at Adam and Eve, and we can say how stupid of it was for you to try to hide from God and cover yourself. It doesn't make any sense. But I want you to think about something. I want you to think about something. It is my contention, based upon the anecdotal experience of my own life, and so if I'm projecting this onto you, I apologize. But I don't think it is possible for anyone to go through a day without sinning. Especially in our culture. It can be something we try to pretend is innocuous and harmful, like coveting. Wanting something somebody has, not being content with what we have and who we are and where we are. It can be something that we consider more serious, violence that we have seen, you know, whatever it is. Selfish anger, and most of our anger is out of selfishness, is it not? And yet, how many times do you do this? How consistent are you on this? That the moment you sin, the moment you sin, the moment you realize you have just sinned, that the first thing you do is to automatically go to God in prayer and not only ask forgiveness, but truly repent, express your sorrow, and beg for the help of the Holy Spirit that you will be able to master this sin and not do it again. Is that a consistent pattern in your life? Most of the Christians I have met, it's we sin, we sin, we sin, we sin, we sin, and then maybe that night before we fall asleep, we throw up a quick prayer to God, forgive me for my sins, and we don't even list them because we can't even remember all of them. And so we sin, we don't go immediately to God, we don't immediately repent, immediately repent. We don't go immediately to prayer and ask for forgiveness. Instead, what do we do? We sit in our air conditioning with our streaming services in our, in our freedom that we have in this country. What are we doing? Hiding from God amidst God's blessings. Are Adam and Eve really that different from us, folks? And then come the excuses. It's the woman you gave me. The serpent. I don't watch a lot of um, what they used to call daytime TV. I don't watch a lot of Dr. Phil or didn't used to watch Mari Povich or any of that kind of stuff. But the few moments I have seen, have you ever seen anybody take responsibility for their own actions? You get somebody there that is screwed up royally, and what happens? It's my parents' fault. Society's fault. Educational system's fault. Jeff Foxworthy used to joke, because apparently he did watch his stuff. Back in the 90s, Jeff Foxworthy would joke. He said, I will keel over dead if I turn on, like, Oprah or Mari Povich one day, and some guys just stay in there and go, you know what? My mom was okay. My dad was okay. I'm just a jerk. 
We throw up excuses. Just like Adam and Eve. We want to be like God. Our erosion and trust in God falls. We sin. Maybe we feel shame. And then we hide from God amidst his blessings. And then we wonder why our nation is in the state that it's in. We do the same thing. What are we going to do about it? And uh, this may not be the best sermon in the world, but it will be fairly short because this lie to Cain is going to wear off here in a second. And so if you've seen the cartoons with like Yosemite Sam says his biscuits are burning, that's going to be me running out of this church building. Um, What do we do about it? The first thing is something I've told you about many, many, many times. Where do we encounter the gospel of Jesus Christ for the very first time? Genesis 3. Genesis 3. This is what God says to them. Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. Now, I I want to stop there just for a second before I get to it. Why does God curse all of the serpents for Satan's attempt to sabotage his creation? The Jewish people, the ancient Jewish people, had a very interesting take on this. If you go back and read the rabbis at the time of Jesus and so forth and afterwards in the Mishnah and the Talmud, one of the things they say is the reason we still have snakes crawling on their belly, it's supposed to be a reminder from God of the warning of Genesis 3. You may be right. And God says, I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. That is the first prophecy of Jesus Christ. A son of Eve will come, and he will crush the serpent's head, Satan, but he will receive a fatal blow in doing so. There's no treatment for snake bites in the first century. You got a snake bite, you were dead. He's talking about Jesus Christ. And it's interesting. When you get into, later into the New Testament, you get past the Gospels, you get into the writings of Paul. Paul has this very interesting way of describing Jesus Christ that I don't think we've wrestled enough with. He calls Jesus Christ the new Adam, and the last Adam. What does he mean by that? Here's what he means by that. Why is it that all of us have inherited a sinful nature? We get it from Adam and Eve. Why is it that we have decay and death in our world? Because Adam and Eve sinned. Why? Because they represented us. They were the representatives of all humankind, and all humankind paid the penalty for their lack of trust in God. Now, we don't like to hear that in America because in our Western individual society, we like to say, it's all up to us, it's, we do it, and we should be judged on our own merits. But is that really true? If you've got two abusive parents who are addicts, you don't think the kids suffer? Of course they do. If we've got leadership in our country that screws up, don't we all suffer? We like to think that it's all about us, but it's not. And this is not the way the Bible thinks. All the way through the Bible. When we get to King David and King Saul, 
What happens to Israel if Saul and David screw up? The whole country suffers. Because they're the representatives to God of that nation. Adam and Eve were our representatives to God. And we pay the price. We still do. In the sense that if you screw up, if you sin, you don't think your family pays the price? You don't think your friends pay the price? You don't think your church family pays the price? Oh, come on. It's not just about you. If you sin, your spouse, your siblings, your, your, everyone around you is going to pay the price. They're all going to hurt. Adam represented us, and he screwed up, and we're living with the consequences. But Jesus Christ comes along, as Paul says, as the new Adam. And when he does that, he now represents a new people with a new opportunity. An opportunity to be different, be holy, to grow in holiness. A whole new humanity. A new start. This is the new Adam. This is Jesus Christ. He goes to the cross and takes the penalty for our sins. And he takes his perfect life and he gives it to all those who have faith in him so that they may be a new people that he called the church. But he warns his church in the Sermon on the Mount that in order to master their sin, they have to realize where it comes from. You can't blame society. You can't just blame your parents. You can't blame the educational system. You can't blame it. Where does he say it comes from? In Matthew 15, 18 through 19, he says... But the words you speak come from the heart. That's what defiles you, your heart. For from the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. It's within you. It's within you. And the first thing, you, what's the first thing you do? Yet, you know, having shepherded all kinds of addicts through all kinds of stuff, if you're an addict and you go to AA or NA or whatever, what's the first thing you have to admit? I am an addict. The first thing you have to do to master sin, and you'll never completely master it, only Jesus can do that, but you can grow. The first thing you have to do is look yourself in the mirror and go, I am a sinner. I am a sinner. The great Catholic thinker G.K. Chesterton was reading a London newspaper a hundred years ago, more than a hundred years ago, and one of the headlines was, what in the world is wrong with us? What is wrong with the world? And G.K. Chesterton wrote a letter to that journalist and said, sir, I am. I am what's wrong with the world, and so are you. The first thing you have to do is to admit it. And then work on it. We do this in everything else, right? Your car starts to act up, what do you do? Take it to a mechanic, get it fixed. I was Thursday. On Thursday, this past Thursday, I thought... Oh, man, how did I get a rash? I, mean, I don't have, this can't be poison oak or poison ivy. I'm not outdoorsy. What is it? And then Thursday night, I noticed it was spreading. I was like, what in the world is going on? And my wife, who used to do home health care, looked at it and said, oh, honey, those are shingles. And so what do I do? First thing Friday morning, I get in my car, gently, and I drive to urgent care, and the doctor looks at it for like two seconds and said, yep, those are shingles. Here's your, you know, here, go pick up an antiviral, go pick up lidocaine. It's going to last a week to two weeks. It's going to hurt. It's going to stink. Sorry about that.
We have a problem at work, with our car, with our house, with our body. We go and seek to fix it, as we should. And yet, we will wallow in the same sins over and over and over and over again and do nothing to fix it. And the first thing you have to do is admit you have a problem. You have to admit that you are a sinner. That is number one. And number two, you have to recognize the only first step, the only first step in fixing the problem is turning to Jesus Christ, the new Adam, the last Adam, the better Adam, and go to him and if you have to, beg for the Holy Spirit and for a community of accountability to kill off this sin out of love for and gratitude to Jesus Christ. Now, that may take some practical efforts. Some people get really frustrated because they pray and they expect God to magically zap them and get rid of their sin. And God doesn't always do that. Has he done that? I've known of some cases, miraculous cases. Like I've said, the rocker Alice Cooper, who in the 1970s, you would never have guessed would have become a Christian. And now he does ads for his church. Alice Cooper does ads for his church in Phoenix, Arizona. And Alice Cooper, in 1985, his wife, his father, who's a pastor, his father-in-law, who's a pastor, prayed over him, and he hasn't had a drink since, and he was an alcoholic. He was drinking two to three fifths of whiskey a day. And he hasn't had a drink since. He calls himself a healed alcoholic. Now, that can happen, but that's rare. Can we recognize that? Sometimes you have to take practical steps. It's like the old story. It's the old cliche, right? We've seen flooding in Miami this week. And you'll see before it's all over, helicopters coming down, people on their roofs. And the old story is, God, the waters are rising, save me. And some guy and a sheriff deputy comes by in a boat and says, jump in. No, the Lord will save me. And then a helicopter comes by, Coast Guard, and says, jump in. No, the Lord will save me. And then he drowns, and he goes to heaven, and he goes to the Lord, and he says, why didn't you save me? He said, what are you talking about? I sent a boat and a helicopter, dummy. Sometimes you just have to take practical steps, right? If you're struggling with addiction, get the booze out of your house. If you're struggling with pornography, get, you know, put an internet filter on or accountability software or whatever it is. If you're struggling with, you're just spending and spending because you're greedy and you just want stuff and you become materialistic, cut up the credit cards. Whatever you have to do, take those steps, but pray too. Recognize you're a sinner. Go to Jesus Christ. He is the new Adam. He is our new Adam, and he deserves obedience and love and gratitude. He deserves us all to be working on developing a holy character. Tim Keller was asked once, Dr. Tim Keller, what does it mean when the Bible says Jesus is the new Adam? He says it's, it means he's the better Adam. He says Adam is placed in paradise and he's told, he's only given one negative command, just stay away from that and you will live. Jesus Christ is sent into poverty and wanders homeless and is required to obey every law perfectly. And in response, he will get death and he obeyed. That's why he's the new and better Adam. Adam is told, 
Obey, you will get life. Jesus is told, obey, and you will get death. And only Jesus obeyed. Jesus is nailed to a cross. They didn't call it a cross back then, by the way. If you read the Jewish literature, they will say, cursed is anyone who is hung from a tree. What they meant was not hanging. They didn't do a lot of that. What they meant was crucifixion. They called the cross the tree. Strange, isn't it? Because trees pop up everywhere in the Bible, prominently. Tree of knowledge of good and evil, the tree of life. Jesus Christ climbed a tree of death in order to give us the tree of life. That's why he's the new Adam, and that's why he's the only solution. Take a long look at yourself every day. Recognize your sin. I'll end this way. George Herbert was a 17th century poet. I'm not much into poetry, but I do like this. He wrote a poem called Sacrifice. It's a very long poem. You can Google it and find it if you want, if you're into that kind of thing. The poem that he wrote is written from the perspective of Jesus Christ on the cross, looking down at the people he is trying to save. And he wrote this. Here's what he imagines Jesus is saying. O all who pass by, behold and see. Man stole the fruit, but I must climb the tree. The tree of life to all, except for me. Don't you owe him that? Let's pray. Father God, may we not read through Genesis 3 casually and think, what fools. When we want to be like you sinfully, we don't trust you as we should. We sin, sometimes not even feel shame, and hide from you amidst your blessings. When your son had no blessings, on this earth and he obeyed all and try, climbed the tree of death so that we may have the tree of life, eternal life may we take our sins seriously out of love for you out of gratitude for you to do what must be done to glorify you and live lives of holiness gracious loving holiness before the world as your church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, before you go, got one more quick um, favor to ask of you. We need to put up the chairs because we need to clear out for VBS this week. So if you could help with that. I know Blake's already back there and ready to rock and roll. God bless you. God goes with you. And I guarantee you this, you'll have a better week than I will. See ya. Christ Community meets on Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday at 10.30 a.m. For more information, visit www.christcommunity.net or check out our Facebook page.